Welcome to the Enchanted Library, where we turn the pages of books, beautiful and old, living and magical. It's time to curl up, get cozy, and join us on an adventure. Today we're reading from The Wonder Book by Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Miraculous Pitcher. Although good Mother Boschus was a simple old dame, she could not but think that there was something rather out of the common way in all that had been going on. So after helping the guests to bread and honey, and laying a bunch of grapes by each of their plates, she sat down by Philemon and told him what she had seen in a whisper. "'Did you ever hear the like?' asked she. "'No, I never did,' answered Philemon with a smile. "'And I rather think, my dear old wife, that you have been walking about in a sort of dream. "'If I had poured out the milk, I should have seen through the business at once. "'There happened to be a little more in the pitcher than you thought. That is all.' "'Ah, husband,' said Boschus, "'say what you will. These are very uncommon people.' "'Well, well,' replied Philemon, still smiling, "'perhaps they are.' They certainly do look as if they had seen better days, and I am heartily glad to see them making so comfortable a supper. Each of the guests had now taken his bunch of grapes upon his plate. Boschus, who rubbed her eyes in order to see the more clearly, wasn't of the opinion that the clusters had grown larger and richer, and that each separate grape seemed to be on the point of bursting with ripe juice. It was entirely a mystery to her how such grapes could have ever been produced from the old stunted vine that climbed against the cottage wall. "'Very admirable grapes, these,' observed Quicksilver, as he swallowed one after another, without apparently diminishing his cluster. "'Pray, my good host, whence did you gather them?' "'From my own vine,' answered Philemon. "'You may see one of its branches twisting across the window yonder, but wife and I never thought the grapes very fine ones.' "'I never tasted better,' said the guest. "'Another cup of this delicious milk, if you please, "'and I shall then have supped better than a prince.' "'This time old Philemon bestirred himself and took up the pitcher, "'for he was curious to discover whether there was any reality in the marvels "'which Boschus had whispered to him. "'He knew that his good old wife was incapable of falsehood, "'and that she seldom was mistaken in what she supposed to be true.' but this was so very singularly a case that he wanted to see it with his own eyes. On taking up the pitcher, therefore, he slyly peeped into it, and was fully satisfied it contained not so much as a single drop. All at once, however, he beheld a little white fountain, which gushed up from the bottom of the pitcher, and speedily filled it to the brim with foaming and deliciously fragrant milk. It was lucky that Philemon, in his surprise, did not drop the miraculous pitcher from his hand— "'Who are ye, wonder-working strangers?' cried he, even more bewildered than his wife had been. "'Your guests, my good Philemon, and your friends,' replied the elder traveller, in his mild, deep voice, which had something at once sweet and awe-inspiring in it. "'Give me likewise a cup of the milk, and may your pitcher never be empty for kind Boschus and yourself, any more than for the needy wayfarer.' The supper being now over, the strangers requested to be shown to their place of repose. The old people would gladly have talked with them a little longer, and have expressed the wonder that they felt, and their delight at finding the poor and meager supper prove so much better and more abundant than they hoped. But the elder traveller had inspired them with such reverence that they dared not ask him any questions. And when Philemon drew Quicksilver aside, and inquired how under the sun a fountain of milk could have gotten into an old earthen pitcher— the latter personage pointed to his staff. "'There is the whole mystery of the affair,' quoth Quicksilver, "'and if you can make it out, I'll thank you to let me know. "'I can't tell what to make of my staff. "'It is always playing such odd tricks as this, "'sometimes getting me a supper, "'and quite as often stealing it away. "'If I had any faith in such nonsense, "'I should say the stick was bewitched.' "'He said no more, but looked so slyly in their faces "'that they rather fancied he was laughing at them.' The magic staff went hopping at his heels as Quicksilver quitted the room. When left alone, the good old couple spent some little time in conversation about the events of the evening, and then lay down on the floor and fell fast asleep. 
They had given up their sleeping room to the guests, and had no other bed for themselves save these planks, which I wish had been as soft as their own hearts. The old man and his wife were stirring betimes in the morning, and the strangers likewise arose with the sun, and made their preparations to report. Philemon hospitably entreated them to stay a little longer, until Boschus could milk the cow and bake a cake upon the hearth, and perhaps find them a few fresh eggs for breakfast. The guests, however, seemed to think it better to accomplish a good part of their journey before the heat of the day should come on. They, therefore, persisted in setting out immediately, but asked Philemon and Boschus to walk forth with them a short distance, and show them the road which they were to take. So they all four issued from the cottage, chatting together like old friends. It was very remarkable, indeed, how familiar the old couple insensibly grew with the elder traveller, and how their good and simple spirits melted into his, even as two drops of water would melt into the illimitable ocean. As for Quicksilver, with his keen, quick, laughing wits, he appeared to discover every little thought that but peeped into their minds before they suspected it themselves. They sometimes wished, it is true, that he had not been quite so quick-witted, and also that he would fling away his staff, which looked so mysteriously mischievous, with the snakes always writhing about it. But then again, Quicksilver showed himself so very good-humoured, that they would have rejoiced to keep him in their cottage, staffs, snakes, and all, every day, and the whole day long. "'Ah, me, well a day!' exclaimed Philemon, as they had walked a little way from their door. If our neighbors only knew what a blessed thing it is to show hospitality to strangers, they would tie up all their dogs and never allow their children to fling another stone. It is a sin and shame for them to behave so, that it is, cried good old Boschus vehemently, and I mean to go this very day and tell some of them what naughty people they are. I fear, remarked Quicksilver, slyly smiling, that you will find none of them at home. The elder traveller's brow just then assumed such a grave, stern, and awful grandeur, yet serene withal, that neither Boschus nor Dilemon dared to speak a word. They gazed reverently into his face, as if they had been gazing at the sky. "'When men do not feel toward the humblest stranger as if he were a brother,' said the traveller, in tones so deep that they sounded like those of an organ, they are unworthy to exist on earth, which was created as the abode of a great human brotherhood. And by the by, my dear old people, cried Quicksilver, with the liveliest look of fun and mischief in his eyes, where is the same village that you talk about? On which side of us does it lie? Methinks I do not see it hereabouts. Philemon and his wife turned toward the valley, where at sunset only the day before they had seen the meadows, the houses, the gardens, the clumps of trees— the wide, green-margined street with children playing on it, and all the tokens of business, enjoyment, and prosperity. But what was their astonishment? There was no longer any appearance of a village. Even the fertile vale, in the hollow in which it lay, had ceased to have existence. In its stead they beheld the broad blue surface of a lake, which filled the great basin of the valley from brim to brim, and reflected the surrounding hills in its bosom, with as tranquil an image as if it had been there ever since the creation of the world. For an instant the lake remained perfectly smooth. Then a little breeze sprang up, and caused the water to dance, glitter, and sparkle in the early sunbeams, and to dash, with a pleasant rippling murmur, against the hither shore. The lake seemed so strangely familiar that the old couple were greatly perplexed, and felt as if they could have only have been dreaming about a village having lain there. But the next moment they remembered the vanished dwellings, and the faces and characters of the inhabitants, far too distinctly for a dream. The village had been there yesterday, and now was gone. Alas! cried these kind-hearted old people. What has happened of our poor neighbors? They exist no longer as men and women, said the elder traveller in his grand and deep voice, while a roll of thunder seemed to echo it at a distance. There was neither use nor beauty in such a life as theirs, for they never softened nor sweetened the hard lot of mortality by the exercise of kindly affections between man and man. They retained no image of the better life in their bosoms. Therefore the lake that was of old has spread itself forth again to reflect the sky. As for those foolish people, 
said Quicksilver, with his mischievous smile. They're all transformed to fishes. There needed be little change, for they were already a scaly set of rascals, and the cold-blooded beings in existence. So, kind Mother Boshus, whenever you or your husband have an appetite for fit a dish of boiled trout, he can throw in a line and pull out half a dozen of your old neighbors. Oh, cried Boshus, shuddering, I would not for the world put one of them on the gridiron. No, added Philemon, making a wry face, we could never relish them. As for you, good Philemon, continued the elder traveler, you, and kind Boshus, you with your scanty means, have mingled so much heartfelt hospitality with your entertainment of the homeless stranger, that the milk became an inexhaustible fount of nectar, and the brown loaf and honey were ambrosia. Thus the divinities have feasted at your board, off the same viands that supply their banquets on Olympus. You have done well, my dear old friends. Wherefore, request whatever favor you have most at heart, and it is granted. Philemon and Boschus looked at one another, and then, I know not which of the two of it was who spoke, but that one uttered the desire of both of their hearts. Let us live together while we live, and leave the world at the same instant when we die." for we have always loved one another. Be it so, replied the stranger with majestic kindness. Now look toward your cottage. They did so. But what was their surprise on beholding a tall edifice of white marble with a wide open portal occupying the spot where their humble residence had so lately stood. There is your home, said the stranger, benevolently smiling on them both. "'Exercise your hospitality in yonder palace "'as freely as in the poor hovel "'to which you welcomed us last evening.' "'The old folks fell on their knees to thank him, "'but behold, neither he nor Quicksilver was there. "'So Philemon and Boschus took up their residence "'in the marble palace, "'and spent their time with vast satisfaction to themselves, "'in making everybody jolly and comfortable "'who happened to pass that way.' The milk pitcher, I must not forget to say, retained its marvelous quality of never being empty, when it was desirable to have it full. Whenever an honest, good-humored, and free-hearted guest took a drop from this pitcher, he invariably found it the sweetest and most invigorating fluid that ever ran down his throat. But if a cross or disagreeable curmudgeon happened to sip, he was pretty certain to twist his visage into a hard knot, and pronounce it a pitcher of sour milk." Thus the old couple lived in their palace a great, great while. It grew old and older, very old indeed. At length, however, there came a summer morning when Philemon and Boschus failed to make their appearance, as on other mornings, with one hospitable smile overspreading both their pleasant faces, to invite the guests of overnight to breakfast. The guests searched everywhere, from top to bottom of the spacious palace, and all to no purpose. But, after a great deal of perplexity— they espied in front of the portal two venerable trees, which nobody could remember of having seen there the day before. Yet there they stood, with their roots fastened deep into the soil, and a huge breadth of foliage overshadowing the whole front of the edifice. One was an oak, the other a linden tree. Their boughs, it was strange and beautiful to see, were intertwined together and embraced one another, so that each tree seemed to live in the other tree's bosom much more than its own. While the guests were marveling at how these trees, that must have required at least a century to grow, could have come to be so tall and venerable in a single night, a breeze sprang up and set their intermingled boughs astir, and there was a deep, broad murmur in the air as if the old, two mysterious trees were speaking. "'I am old Philemon,' murmured the oak. "'I am old Boschus," murmured the linden tree. But as the gre breeze grew stronger, the trees both spoke at once. Philemon, Boschus, Boschus, Philemon, as if one were both and both were one, and talking together in the depths of their mutual heart. It was plain enough to perceive that the old couple had renewed their age, and were now to spend a quiet and delightful hundred years or so, Philemon as an oak, and Boschus as a linden tree. And oh, what a hospitable shade did they fling around them! Whenever a wayfarer paused beneath it, he heard a pleasant whisper of leaves above his head, and wondered how the sound should so much resemble words like these, Welcome, welcome, dear traveler, welcome. And some kind soul, that knew what would have pleased old Boschus and old Philemon best, built a circular seat around both their trunks. 
where, for a great while afterward, the weary and hungry and thirsty used to repose themselves and quaff milk abundantly out of the miraculous pitcher, and I wish for all our sakes that we had this pitcher here now. How much did the pitcher hold? asked Sweet Fern. It did not hold quite a quart, answered the student, but you might keep pouring milk out of it till you should fill a hog's head if you pleased. The truth is, it would run on forever and not be dry even at midsummer, which is more that can be said of yonder rill that goes babbling down the hillside. And what has become of the pitcher now? inquired the little boy. It was broken, I'm sorry to say, about twenty-five thousand years ago, replied Cousin Eustace. The people mended it as well as they could, but though it would hold milk pretty well, it was never afterward known to fill itself of its own accord. So you see, it was no better than any other cracked earthen pitcher. What a pity, cried all the children at once. The respectable dog Ben had accompanied the party, as did likewise a half-grown Newfoundland puppy, who went by the name of Bruin, because he was just as black as a bear. Ben, being elderly and of very circumspect habits, had was respectfully requested by Cousin Eustace to stay behind with the four little children in order to keep them out of mischief. As for Black Bruin, who was himself nothing but a child, the student thought it best to take him along, lest in his rude play with the other children he should trip them up and send them rolling and tumbling down the hill, advising Cowslip, Sweet Fern, Dandelion, and Squash Blossom to sit pretty still in the spot where he left them. The student, with Primrose and the elder children, began to ascend and were soon out of sight among the trees. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and share our podcast with a friend. Visit our website at www.enchantedlibrary.net to see our past books or to connect with us on Facebook. If you'd like to support the work we do, you can visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash enchantedlibrary. We appreciate your support. Until next time, friends, happy reading.